Okay, everybody. Uh, welcome to our first lecture or impromptu lecture for our online section of probability and statistics. Uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to walk you through the first chapter of lecture slides that I've created. Uh, again, if you are trying to find these lecture slides, if you log on to the MyStatLab website, of course, documents, you can find these lecture slides in the lecture slides tab. So right now I'm going through chapter one online lecture dot PDF. Uh, so if you want to download those and print them off or just have them for your sake, you're welcome to follow along. Otherwise, you can just uh, uh, check out here and just follow along with the video. Um, so in Chapter 1, uh, I'll start out just kind of motivating what we're going to be studying over the next 10 weeks. Uh, you know, in real life, a lot of institutions or companies, uh, they're really actually interested in knowing the answer to questions that we can't actually answer. Okay, so as an example, what if I gave you this challenge? What if I came to you and I said, your job is to estimate the average yearly income of all CBC students, all of them that are currently enrolled. All right, so this is a pretty, uh, pretty big challenge, all right? But uh, you gotta find a way to do it. Now, if you're gonna try to estimate the average yearly salary of all CBC students, there's a few things to consider. Um, is it actually possible to ever know the truth, the actual true average of all the students. Another question you have to ask is, well, how are you even going to go about collecting information to try to answer this question? And uh, beyond that, what types of challenges are you going to face in actually getting this information? Okay. So I'm going to expound a little bit on each of these topics. Now, the question, is it actually possible to know? I would actually propose to you that it's not. You couldn't actually ever know the true average salary of CBC students because first off, you're probably not going to actually be able to track down every single CBC student on campus. Now the problem is, is that even if you could somehow do that with uh, maybe get their social security numbers and find their tax returns or something, I don't know, even if you could do that, the problem is, is that the population of CBC students is constantly changing. Every day someone enrolls and someone drops out. Okay, So even if you did a really good job getting all the students that are enrolled right now, well shoot in two hours some of those might not be students and some we might have students now that aren't in your uh, in your study. Okay, The other problem is that salaries change all the time. So even if you got everybody and actually calculated their average salary, well by the time you did all that work their salaries have probably changed. They're probably not actually current. Some people lost jobs, some people got new jobs, some people got raises, some people got their hours cut. Okay, so it's really not ever possible to know the exact average salary of all CBC students. So the solution that we use in statistics is we just take a subset of students. We say, okay, I realize I can't talk to everyone, but maybe I can talk to some people, and I can use those uh, people to make an educated guess about the whole population. Now, you say, okay, I realize I can't get everyone, so I'll take a, a small subset. Now, how are you going to actually uh, get, how are you going to go about getting that information? Um, you have to decide how many students are you going to talk to. You have to decide which of the students are you going to talk to. Um, and you have to say, how are you going to actually get to them? Are you going to send out surveys? Are you going to try to track people down on campus? And um, all of these uh, different options, they're going to have pretty big implications on how accurate your final results are. Um, now, even if you come up with a nice design where you say, hmm, this is how I'm going to talk to these people, uh, there's always going to be some issues. Um, students could just not participate. You might do your best to contact someone and they might not want to participate or they might not be reachable. Uh, the other thing is uh, people give you false information. They might lie to you um, or maybe they just don't know or they give you answers that aren't true. Okay, So there's always some gray area here. All right. So this small example where we're, we're trying really hard to answer a question, uh, what's the average salary of all CBC students, it can't actually be answered. Okay? But uh, this, is, this is what we're going to be trying to do in statistics, you know, estimate values that we can't actually ob ever observe. Uh, a few key terms that we're going to talk about here. The first is the population. The population is the entire set of individuals that you're interested in. This is everybody, everybody that you wish you could observe, but unfortunately you probably can't. So instead, what do we do? We take that subset, we settle for a sample. And a sample is a subset of the population that we actually uh, observe. The sample is taken by selecting individuals from the population. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more about how you would get that sample uh, a little later in this chapter. 
So let's think about the CBC example. So suppose you decide to pick 300 students and ask them what their salary is. Um, what's the population here and what is the sample? Well, the population, that's going to be all currently enrolled students at CBC. That's everybody. But the sample is actually just the 300 students which you actually select and uh, collect information about. All right. So population is everyone. The sample is the small group you actually observe. Uh, we always we also distinguish between variables which describe our population versus uh, things that describe our sample. Um, and parameters are what we call those variables that describe the population. Uh, remember, our goal is to say something about the population, and it's the parameters that describe the population. Uh, but the parameters are never actually observable, so the best we can do is we can estimate them. Like I'll never know the true average salary, so I'm, but maybe I could estimate it. And what we, the way we estimate those, we estimate those with statistics. And statistics are values that we actually calculate and observe from a sample. So hopefully we're going to use those statistics to make educated guesses about the population. So go to the CBC example. Suppose you go out, you collect 300 students, you ask them what their yearly salary is, and of the 300 students you select, you get an average salary of $24,315 a year. What would be a parameter here, and what is the statistics? Now remember, the parameter is usually unknown. The parameter is the average salary of all CBC students. It, there, it exists. The value is out there. I'll just never know it. The statistic, however, is the number we got from our sample. That's 24,315, the average of our 300 observed people. Um, if you're having trouble remembering, I always just match the first letters. Uh, the parameters describe the population, while the statistics describe the sample. Okay. All right. These kind of all fit together in a nice little uh, thing I like to call the big picture of statistics. Um, and it's kind of uh, pictured in this diagram here on slide 11. Uh, you, it says that uh, you start with the population in the top left corner right here, right? So the population. And from that population, because we can't actually talk to everybody, we take a sample. And from that sample, we're actually going to calculate a statistic. And from that statistic, we're going to attempt to estimate the parameter. And that parameter is what describes the population. All right? So typically, we divide statistics into two different types. Um, there's descriptive statistics, and there's inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics are just numerical and graph graphical summaries that describe the sample. Okay? They don't make any attempt to estimate the, anything about the population. They only describe what is in the sample. Whereas inferential st statistics uh, is a step where we actually take the sample and we estimate characteristics about the population. So in the inferential step, we're actually trying to make educated guesses or inferences about the population. All right. So uh, looking at this big picture of statistics back on uh, slide 11, the, uh, the descriptive part is right here, where we take a sample and calculate statistics. The inferential step is where we try to go from statistics to estimating parameters about the population. Okay. So here's your descriptive step. And here's your uh, inferential step. All right. So let's look at an example. On election day, a sample of local voters is taken at the polls. And a local news outlet uses the sample to state that 36% of those polled said they would be voting for a Democratic Party candidate. Is this descriptive or inferential? Well, the answer is this is descriptive. Because they only report the value that was observed in their sample, 36%. In the next example... A newspaper contacts 200 randomly selected residents in the county and finds that 66% of their samples say they will be voting for the Democratic Party candidate in the upcoming election. The newspaper uses this information to predict that the Democratic Party candidate will win the upcoming election. Is this descriptive or inferential? In this case, this is inferential. The newspaper used the data they collected and they actually made a prediction about the upcoming election. Do they know for sure what will happen in the upcoming election? Of course not. They're making an inference. Now, uh, so you decide you're going to go out and you're going to collect some data, all right? How are you going to actually get this information? Well, we typically group data collection into two categories. Uh, there's observational studies and there's designed experiments. And there's a big difference. In observational studies, data is collected by just observing characteristics of individuals uh, who have been selected for the sample. There's no attempt to make any sort of uh, impression on these people to try to get them to answer or respond to things a certain way. We're just seeing uh, how they respond or, or what has been observed about them. Okay, These are the most common type of data collections that you see. Uh, you see this in surveys, 
Uh, there's a lot of data mining of historical records and medical records, just looking back at things that have happened. But this is in contrast to what we call designed experiments. And in, in a designed experiment, you actually deliberately impose or withhold a treatment on individuals to try to see if it affects a variable of interest. Okay? Uh, these are much more time consuming, um, much harder to do, but very important. Uh, you see these in clinical trials, you see these in laboratory experiments. Okay? And the main difference between these two is uh, one of them you're just looking at what has happened in an observational study and you don't have a lot of control. Uh, and the other, you very much control the uh, parameters, uh, the aspects of your experiment, and it gives you a lot more uh, control over you know, other variables that might have an effect on your study. Whereas an observational study, it's kind of at the whim of, of whatever those people were doing at the time or, or whatever. Okay, let's look at an example. So, uh, to study the relationship between prostate cancer and vasectomies, a physician looked at the records of 22,000 men who had had vasectomies and found that 113 had developed prostate cancer sometime in their lifetime. So this compared to a rate of 70 cases in 22,000 men who had not had vasectomies. So the researcher used this information to conclude that there could possibly be a relationship between prostate cancer and vasectomies, and it should be further studied. Is this observational design or a design experiment? And in this case, this is an observational study. Records were obtained and observed, but there was no attempt to impose a treatment. Uh, he, I don't even know how you would impose that treatment on people. Uh, give some people vasectomies and some people no vasectomies. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, there was no control here, and so this is an observational study. And I think it has to be. I don't know how else you would uh, research this topic besides an observational study. Let's look at another example. A study is conducted to determine if folic acid supplements can decrease the occurrence of birth defects in newborns. So to do this, a team of researchers obtains a sample of 4,500 women. They randomly select half to receive a folic acid supplement. And after all of the mothers delivered, it's found that those who took the supplement got uh, birth defect rates of 13 per 1,000. And those who didn't take the supplement had birth defect rates of 23 per 1,000. Is this observational or an experiment? And this is an example of an experiment. Because expectant mothers in this case were actually deliberately given or withheld a folic acid treatment to see if it actually had an effect on birth defects. Okay. So this is a controlled environment. You give some treatments and some you don't. That's a design experiment. All right. So uh, in either, either way you design your study, whether it be observational or experimental, at some point uh, you have to take a sample. Okay. You can't look at every woman. You can't look at every man. Okay. You have to pick a sample. And one of the keys to collecting a sample is there has to be randomness. Okay. There has to be randomness in the way you collect your sample. Now, randomness in statistics does not mean the same thing that randomness means colloquially. Okay. A simple random sample is a very specific type of sample uh, outlined here. It has to meet two criteria. It has to be a population of size n which is obtained such that each individual has an equal chance of selection and every possible sample size n has an equal chance. Okay. Basically it means that everyone has an equal shot at getting picked. Now, typically the way we do this is we use statistical software. Um, it can be done using a table of random digits. You can get one in your textbook. Uh, I suppose it could also be done just by throwing everybody's name in a hat on equal size paper and drawing out names. Uh, the problem with the names in a hat is if you have a population of 5 million people, um, that's going to be an awfully big hat that you're going to try to be throwing 5 million people's names into. Okay, uh, now, one thing to notice on this slide, slide 17, um, you'll notice that italicized lowercase n. In statistics in general, and pretty much universally, uh, a little n means sample size number of observations, okay, pretty much always. It's going to always mean that in our class, it's probably going to mean that in almost any math class, and uh, especially almost any statistics class, all right? So keep that in mind, little n is always sample size. All right, now, a simple random sample is always uh, a decent bet, but um, there are other sampling designs that can have advantages and disadvantages over simple random sample. Um, so we're going to talk about a few. The first is a systematic sampling. And in a systematic sample, individuals are picked just using some pattern. So you might just select every per fifth person on the roster, or you might grid up a map, okay, and just sample at the intersection of each grid. Now, the advantages to a systematic sample are these are very easy to implement. 
Okay, it's very easy to program a machine to just pick up every fifth person, or uh, to just pick every fifth person on your roster. You don't have to go to a software program and pick out random numbers. Um, you just say, "Oh, here's my people." Okay, right? very easy. Um, in spatial applications, like on a map uh, with a grid, it's a pretty, it's not a bad idea because it gives you coverage of the entire space. The problem is, is that there's no randomness involved. Okay, so a bias sample could be uh, a possibility. All right. Um, spatially, you might grid up your uh, your map, and then you might take them every gridded space. But what if you don't make your grid big enough? Uh, maybe you miss things that you might catch with a random sample. Or what if you're in a machine and um, in an assembly line, and you just pick every tenth item or every hundredth item? Well, maybe your uh, machine has a glitch in it where it just screws up every seventh item. Okay. And by you picking every tenth item, you might miss all of the messed up items. Okay. All right. So easy to implement, but no randomness could lead to bias. All right, the next is a stratified sample. And in a stratified sample, the first thing you do is you split your population into groups, or strata, as they're sometimes called. This is why we call it stratified sampling. Um, and the strata are based on some identifying characteristics. Then you go into each group, and you pick a random sample from each of those groups. Okay. So as an example, if I was interested in how people feel about their garbage service in Pasco, uh, I could split the whole city of Pasco into neighborhoods, and I could go into each neighborhood and take a random sample in each neighborhood. The advantages to a simple random sample is you're going to see coverage from every single group, so nobody gets left out. Okay, I'm going to get opinions from every part of the city. Um, it also allows a researcher to see how different groups are affected by the variables. Uh, if we're looking at trash collection, and I go into every neighborhood, I might find out that some neighborhoods are really happy with their trash service, and some neighborhoods are really dissatisfied. Now, the downside to a stratified sample is that it can be really time consuming and labor intensive. And what this really means is it can be more expensive. Okay? And, uh, and really, money does become a limiting factor in a lot of statistical studies. Um, it takes a lot of time, and it would cost a lot of money to pay someone to go to every single neighborhood in Pasco and knock on uh, some randomly selected doors and get enough samples. Okay, so uh, pretty good sample design. It has the randomness in that you randomly select uh, people within each group, but uh, it can be expensive and time-consuming. All right, so to kind of remedy that, uh, something that we've also come up with is what's called a cluster sample. In a cluster sample, it starts the same way. So you split your population into groups. Uh, and then, instead of going into every group and taking a sample, you just uh, take a subset of the groups, you randomly select a few of the groups, and you pick everybody in that group. So, in the neighborhood example for Pasco, rather than going to every neighborhood that I've identified in Pasco, uh, what I might do instead is I might just pick four randomly selected neighborhoods around the city, and then go into those neighborhoods and try to talk to everybody, as many people as I could. Okay, now. The advantage here is that it's going to be less time consuming than stratify sampling, okay? Because I actually get, I just only have to go to one location and walk around and talk to as many people as I can. I don't have to go all over the city just trying to talk to a few people in each part of the city. The problem though is that you're more likely to miss certain groups, particularly groups that make up a really small portion of the population, okay? Um, and uh, we'll see that in an example I'm about to give you. All right. So let's look at this. In this example, I'm interested in trying out a new format for final exams at the math department. So to do this, I'm just going to randomly select one section of each course offering. So I've split up all of the math courses at CBC by their number. Okay, so 95, 146. And then, so I'm going to go into one section of each of these, and I'm going to randomly select three students in each section, and they're going to get a new format of the test. So what type of sampling is this? This would be an example of a stratified sample. Okay, we split the groups, we split the uh, population into groups by their course number, and then within each group we pick a few students. All right, pretty straightforward. The nice thing here is that we're going to see how this new format would affect people all the way from the 80s, 90s, 100s, and up. Okay, um, now the hard part here is it's going to be difficult. We're going to have to go into a whole bunch of different classes and get a whole bunch of different instructors to give a few students different types of exams, compile it all back together. Okay, it's going to be a mess, uh, but it could be useful information, all right? Okay. 
Now, uh, let's say I try a different approach, though. Okay. Suppose I'm trying the new format for the final exams, but instead what I do is, rather than going and uh, just selecting a section from every, every level, maybe I just randomly select uh, 10 uh, math listings. Okay? And I go into those, and I just go to each class, and I just administer the final to everybody. Okay? So maybe I randomly end up picking Math 84, so I get an 84 section, go in and do everybody the new way. And I end up with Math 94, so I go to 94 and do everybody. And I end up with 146, and I go to everybody in a section of 146. Okay. What type of sampling design is this? So this is a cluster sampling design. So in this case, rather than going to uh, every single number in the department and getting a sample for students in that level of math, um, I'm only going to see 10 sections. And what's going to happen is inevitably, because we have more than 10 different levels of math, at CBC, I'm going to miss some levels. Okay, uh, which ones am I going to miss? I'm probably going to miss the courses that are offered less frequently, right? Uh, there's just not as many linear algebra courses at CBC, so there's a good chance I'm not going to see uh, this new format in a linear algebra test. There are a lot of sections of probability and statistics, so I'm probably going to see a section of probability and statistics. Okay. Um, on the plus side though, it's going to be really easy to implement. I only have to go to 10 sections and 10 instructors and just implement the uh, exam to all those students. It makes it nice and easy and clean. I can collect my data back and it uh, shouldn't be too much of an issue. Okay. So again, cluster is easier but less informative with the risk of missing people. Uh, stratified is harder but you're more likely to see everybody and make maybe some more detailed inference. Okay. So those are some of our different sampling designs. All right, so I want to spend this last part of chapter one then talking a little bit more about experiments. Um, a few terms we're going to use here for experiments. Uh, the first term I want to introduce is what we call a treatment. And the treatment is the variable that we either introduce or withhold because we believe it has some effect. Okay, in a clinical trial, this is going to be the drug that you're either going to give them or not give them. If you're doing an agricultural study, this might be the pesticide you're either going to use or not use. Okay. Then we have another variable, which is the response. And the response is the variable we think is actually going to be affected by that treatment. Okay? So if you're doing a clinical trial for a blood pressure medication, the medication is the treatment, the response is patient's blood, blood pressure levels. Okay? So uh, if you go back to slide 16, there was an example where they were giving folic acid to pregnant mothers. And they were, e they were observing if it affected the birth defect rates. Um, so here, what's the treatment and what's the response? Well, the treatment is folic acid supplementation, because they're either getting it or not. And the response is the associated birth defect rates with the women who either got it or didn't get it. OK. There's a few aspects that have to be in place for experiments. They're crucial. Okay, The first is control. You have to have a control group in an experiment. And this is a group who are intentionally withheld the treatment. Okay, They are not given the treatment. Um, this is essentially serving as a baseline to compare against when we look at the people who did get the treatment. Okay. Control groups can be easily created when you're dealing with non-humans. So in an agricultural study, if I'm trying a new uh, pesticide treatment on plots of land, well, uh, my stalks of corn don't really care whether they're getting pesticides or not. They don't know. They're either going to respond or not respond to it. Okay. Uh, I don't really need to give a placebo to those plants. But in humans, we actually do. Uh, humans, we are pretty gullible, and the placebo effect is a very real phenomenon in that when humans receive a treatment, whether it's effective or not, they will report that they feel better or that they are responding just because they think they're getting treatment. So you can give me a sugar pill, and I, c I might report to you that I feel better because I took that sugar pill, simply because I believe that you gave me uh, a treatment, right? So uh, what we do is we use placebos. So we give people uh, pills even if they're not getting the treatment. And we give people pills if they are getting the treatment. All right? That way we can take into account the placebo effect and see if the drug is effective. All right? um, randomization, we talked about this with simple random samples. But it's, in, it's essential that you use randomization and selecting people to either get the treatments or the controls. Um, this is to prevent bias sampling. And it also helps to uh, sort of diversify your samples. So if you're random sampling, that means you're very likely to see uh, individuals in your population of all different types in both the treatment and the control groups. Okay, so randomization is essential. And replication is also essential. So 
uh, you have to experiment and replicate this experiment on as many individuals or as big of a sample size as possible. Okay, if uh, you give uh, Tommy a weight loss drug and he loses 200 pounds, well, that's great. But does that mean that everybody who's going to take this weight loss drug is going to lose the weight like Tommy did? Okay, um, and so. If you can replicate though, and you can give this weight loss drug to a thousand people, and a lot, and then maybe 800 of them lose weight, well, maybe now you're onto something. Okay, so the more times you can replicate an experiment, the more effective uh, you can, the more confidently you can say that the treatment was effective. Okay. Uh, the last thing we'll talk about is experimental units, and uh, experimental units. These are the smallest units which the treatment is applied. So. Most of the time, the experimental units are individuals. So if you're in a clinical trial uh, with the folic acid, say, the drug is either given or withheld on an individual level. I either give the drug to a person or don't give it to them. They are the experimental units. Now, sometimes the experimental units have to be multiple individuals. So let's say I'm applying fertilizer to plots of land. Okay? <coughs> I want to give some people fertilizer. I want to give some people, uh, some plants not fertilizer and I want to see what the effect is. Okay. Well, it's going to be really hard for me to randomly select 500 stalks of corn and go give 500 around the field fertilizer and 500 not fertilizer, and uh, that's going to be very time consuming. So instead what I do is maybe you grid up your uh, farm and to plots, and then some of the plots get fertilizer and some of the plots don't. So within the plot, there's a whole lot of corn stalks, but the experimental unit is the whole plot itself, not the corn stalks. Okay. This might happen if you're studying bacteria. So if you're studying bacteria, you might not be able to isolate one bacteria cell per petri dish, but you might be able to. Uh, but you might have a whole lot of bacteria in uh, maybe a hundred petri dishes. So you could randomly select 50 to give uh, some treatment and 50 to not give a treatment. So even though there's multiple bacteria inside the petri dish, the petri dish itself is the experimental unit. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, uh, another thing that we want to talk about, and this is going to be important for one of our types of experimental designs, are uh, what we call factors. And factors are variables that are not the treatment that we still think might affect the response. Okay, And uh, these are important because they affect our ability to see whether our treatments are effective. So think of the folic acid example. Remember, we're giving um, folic acid to women to see if it reduces birth defect rates. So there's a lot of factors that might affect birth defect rates other than whether or not they're getting folic acid. Um, I have a few listed here. Their maternal age, okay? So women over the age of, um, I don't want to mess it up, I believe it's 35, but I could be wrong, but women over the age of 35 uh, are more likely to uh, experience birth defects than women under the age of 35, okay? So it'd be important to know how old are the mothers in your study. It's important to know if there's a family history of birth defects. A lot of birth defects are genetic. And so if there's a family history of these birth defects, you're going to want to know that. All right. The other things you might want to know, I don't know, could be recreational drug use, uh, could be alcohol use, could be um, lifestyle, diet, uh, all sorts of things. Okay, Race, ethnicity, um, all these things could have an effect on the ultimate uh, response, which is birth defect rate. And if you don't take these into account, they could actually potentially mask or exaggerate the effect of treatments. Um, what if you end up with all of your women with family history of birth defects in your uh, treatment group? And so uh, anybody who has a family history of birth defects, right, they're all getting the folic acid, but the folic acid might be canceled out by their um, family history. Okay, So uh, we have to be really careful about identifying these factors in advance. And uh, if you do it in advance, you can actually take that into account of your experiment. I'm going to explain that to you in a second. Um, because the most basic type of experiment is what we call a completely randomized design. And in a completely randomized design, individuals are randomly selected. They're put either in treatment or control. And after some amount of time, you compare them. Okay, So this is just uh, basic, straightforward. Uh, you take half the women and put them over here. Half the women put them over there. Uh, the half over there get... Um, folic acid, the half over here, get a placebo, and then you can compare it. This is really easy to implement. The problem is um, we didn't do what we could have done and we didn't take into account those factors. So what we do instead is ahead of time we say, okay, I think there's some factors at play here, so I'm going to design a randomized block design. And so what we do in a randomized block design is first we split our uh, sample 
into groups based on those factors. Then within each group, we uh, at that point randomly assign treatments and controls. Okay. What the block design does is it provides you the opportunity to see how the treatment can affect different groups of people. It shows whether the treatment is more or less effective in certain factor groups, and it also prevents confounding in the sense that now I know that family history is not going to mask the effectiveness of folic acid because uh, I have all my family history uh, women in one group and all my women without a family history in another group. Okay. Um, I, I threw you some little diagrams here so uh, to kind of explain the difference. The first this is a completely randomized design, right? So let's say you start out with 4,500 women. You uh, split 2,250 uh, randomly assigned up here, and though you get a placebo, you split 2,250 down here, uh, randomly assign them a placebo. You observe the defect rate for each group, and then you compare the rates. Okay, very simple, very easy to do. But let's say you want to take into account um, a factor. So let's say <laughs> the factor you want to consider is family history. Okay, so here again, you start with your 4,500 women, but maybe you have them fill out a survey before the experiment. And in that survey, you find that 500 women have a family history of genetic defects. So what you do is you split those 500 apart from the 4,000 with no family history to begin with. All right, within the 500 that have family history, you randomly assign 250 to a placebo, 250 to a treatment, and you do the same thing in the family history group: 2,000 to placebo, 2,000 to treatment. Then you can observe the defect rates here, 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 and here, and you can compare. Now you can do two things. Well, more than two things. You can look at, was the uh, folic acid effective among people with family history? Was it effective among people with family history? And overall, was it effective? Okay, so it's a lot more powerful. It reduces your risk of confounding the treatment with a factor and uh, it also allows you to look into more specific groups. All right, so this was just a quick overview of the topics in section 1.4. Um, I strongly encourage you to be reading the sections in the book uh, and to be uh, working on the homework and those quizzes that are coming up. All right, I'll see you next time.